Hey, hello everybody, my name is Cool Blue and I'm bringing you all this video of me talking about a board game. This will be under the Cool Blue and Cardboard series and this game will be Renegade, which is a game I will do a playthrough with, a uh, playthrough of after all this. But I just want to take a moment to sit down and talk about this game from some of the things I remember and then also some other things I remember experiencing and from a very recent playthrough that I've done of the game. Uh, so first and foremost, this game is a uh, interesting game. Uh, this game is also out of print, so unfortunately, uh, at the time of this recording, I should say, it's out of print. So it's very hard to find unless you want to spend uh, about $150 for it, which I wouldn't recommend. Um, in particular, not at that price. Uh, for like maybe $45, $50, sure, but anything higher than that is like, eh, mm -hmm, maybe not, it's debatable. But um, as a game, uh, this game is a cooperative game. So it plays one to five people, cooperative game, and it's a um, kind of an action point selection, well, not really action point, but card hand building uh, it's it's a deck builder but it's also you're not you don't have much of a deck you only have 15 cards uh it also has dice rolling involved and you have action points and air majority it's it has a few different mechanics but essentially if you want to boil this down to its core components it's basically a pandemic but with more words um and i say more words instead of more steps because uh if, just to clarify uh, if you've ever played pax emancipation which is a game that I do enjoy, which is the, not the one we're going to talk about now, and maybe I'll do a few, play through this in the future. Pax Emancipation is pandemic, but with more words and more steps. Uh, so that goes along with to say that this particular game, I feel like it, it has the more words part of things, and the steps part, you can make arguments for, it's like, ah, it's too many steps to do a simple thing, but it, it, it adds enough to the game to make it a, an interesting sit down and play. It's, a, it's an interesting puzzle, let me put it that way, that you can play through and uh, try to win. So. Uh, inside the box, if we open it up here, uh, we actually get a few different components. I have all my stuff put into sleeves and boxes, so I, I've long lost the actual uh, insert, if there was an insert for this game. I don't know if there was, but there may have been. So here's a little rule book that goes over some stuff, and it has a few sheets, which we'll talk about the rule book. We'll definitely talk about the rule book a little bit later. Um, and then here's some character sheets. Uh, there's uh, five, so you get seven characters to play with. Uh, so each one of these is double-sided. Uh, sorry, you get nine. Each one of these is double-sided, and then this last one is only one side for the purple player, but you have blue, red, yellow, green, and each one has an alternative character you can play on the other side, which is pretty cool. And then, of course, you have a purple player. Now, uh, one of the things that I want to kind of... Oh, this, this is just the, the cards and stuff. One of the things that I wanted to go ahead and just take a moment to just talk about uh, the, I guess, elephant in the room. Uh, if, if you've heard of Renegade before, if you've seen people talk about Renegade, you might have seen different reviewers or different people. I don't know how you came across this video, but if you did, you may have already seen some other people talk about it. But this game has a, a learning curve that is higher than it should be. And that's basically coming from having to learn the terminology of the game. And I'm not against learning terminologies for games and trying to figure out how the game goes, but also I feel like there's an unnecessary, unnecessary this is elevated to a level that's a little bit higher, you know, maybe punching above its weight as far as the words. <laughs> Whereas uh, it's not as epic of an experience as Pax Emancipation. I'm not saying pa Pax Emancipation is an epic experience, by the way. It's just that Pax Emancipation, I feel like it's just pandemic with way more steps than it should have. Uh, but this one, the, the words do get in the way of the game because I feel like this game plays out pretty simply. Uh, it, has, it has a very, very interesting like cycle that you play through, and it has a very uh, simple, simple set of beats, simple set of beats, I should say, that you can play through, and you can play through that and enjoy the game. But in order to get to that point where you understand enough of what's going on to actually sit down and play the game, uh, it requires you to kind of take a little bit of time and invest in learning all the language of the game, which, for one, depending on what kind of gamer you are, what kind of person you are, that might be way too much that this game's asking for you or from you. Uh, and I totally understand. Like I, I also empathize very much because it took a lot for me to actually sit down and finally remember how to play this game uh, to kind of get that together. So shout out to all the YouTubers out there who made videos and playthroughs. Um, you all's videos helped me get through, and I'll put I'll put some uh, I'll put a card at the top so you can go check out one of my favorite ones that actually helped me get through relearning this game. Uh, without too much stress uh, so definitely shout out to that particular person because uh, i don't remember the name off the top of my head but this is this is the board uh and the board comes in these cool little shapes uh they will say they come in the same shapes but they come in different orientations so for instance uh you want to make sure that all of the arrows or all the numbers are showing in the same same level so actually this is upside down my bad so it's actually supposed to be like that and then you make a little board from that. So the board is variable, so that's a fun thing. It's a modular, not modular, but it's a variable board. And uh, all of this together 
is the board and then you you basically take your character which all these characters come in little standees like this so you stand them like that for this particular demonstration i'll just lay them down on the ground and uh, you'll play your character they start on their home server the home server is their um their color and the six on the color and uh, you get to move around do different things do different actions interact with the board uh like i said you can play up to five players so if you have other players who are involved there's only one of each color except for the twins the twins are different and then you'll go about playing your game and doing stuff. And the game does scale well enough with more players. I've only ever played this with uh, one player, um, but I can definitely try to play like maybe a two-handed gameplay if you all want me to in the future. Um, but I plan on just playing a solo uh, after I finish this. And uh, you kind of move around doing your stuff. Now, the terminology, I spent a moment talking about that, but just to give an example of terminology, uh, we had the concept of a home server. We talked about that already. The home server is your color, is the player's color, and the access point. Your access point is your starting spot. So this access point belongs to these, these, uh, this character, and this is their home server, which is yellow. So their home server is yellow, and their access point is the, is the starting spot, which is always six. Um, and then this whole thing here is called a server. Uh, this individual spot here that I'm pointing to, number five, is a partition. This is a partition, this is a partition, this is a partition. Uh, this whole thing, this whole board is called a network. And just me going over those words, which are very basic and integral to you understanding the game, it, it may already be apparent that there's a lot of words shoved in here that just mean certain things. Like, I can just say the board. And if I say the board, then the board means the board. I know it means the whole board, all of the board, every, every bit of the board. But no, the, the, the game in the rule book and some of the cards refer to these things as the network. And when you say the network, you know, yeah, in the rules, it kind of does a decent job of trying to make sure that you understand what each term means. Uh, and it kind of gives you a translation key, which if we go back to the character sheets, uh, if we'll bring up, uh, let's bring up for better contrast, let's bring up the twins, uh, the techno twins, which is pretty cool. And zoom in here. Uh, you see that you get a key code up here. And that key code is supposed to help you translate some of the words and translate some of the terms. To which I kind of, it kind of brings me to the point that I was mentioning is like, there's so many words that are used that don't really mean anything. And as a person who has struggled through learning how to play PAX Transhumanity, as a person who's, who's struggled through learning how to play PAX Emancipation, um, that's not the thing I was expecting from this game. Um, like I said, I, I played Neanderthal, I played PAX Emancipation, I played, pa I played PAX Renaissance, pretty much Almost every single PAX game has the same problem that this game has, which is that we use words like divest and uh, we use words like uh, like placate heat. Uh, and those are words that come from come from uh, PAX, uh, PAX Transhumanity. And that doesn't mean anything like that. That's a fancy word that doesn't mean anything. But when you actually play the game, placate heat, going back to PAX Transhumanity, means remove one of the cubes from a specific spot. Um, divest means pull a cube back home from a place that it was to back to your home board. And this game follows that same suit where it uses these big fancy words that don't really mean anything to anybody normally. So for instance, every server has a name. So this red one's called salvation, according to that. This one's called virtue. This one's called justice. And I understand what the game's trying to do is trying to have like a theme in there. Like, you know, you're, you're hackers and you're trying to fight against an oppressive machine and you're trying to go out and fight the, the, the sparks, which the sparks are little black circles that, that basically the, the virus of pandemic, if you will. No, oh, sorry, I can't call it virus because viruses are good. In this game, viruses are these ones. So these little red circles, this is called a virus. Uh, this little black circle is called a spark. And the other side of the black circle, which is that one, that's called a, uh, what is that called? Should be over here. Uh, that's called a flare. So that's called a flare. And then uh, this this black square here, this little black square is called a guardian. And this other side is called a firewall. And then this yellow one here is called a replicator, the yellow, that yellow square. And this blue square is called a data port. And you have all these words as like, okay, wh why can't you just say blue square? Why, why can't you just say yellow square? Why, why can't we just say the black square, the white square? Um, and and it, on the one hand, I understand from like a thematic, you're trying to tell a story part, but much in the same way that I critique the crap out of, uh, or that, I, that feels deserving, if I should say, uh, the critiques of Pax Emancipation, Pax Renaissance, or yeah, Pax, Pax Emancipation, Pax Renaissance, all the Pax games, basically, is that there's a lot of lore thrown into the game, a lot of like words and historical facts, if you will, but they get in the way of the game. Um, I understand that when I play Pax Transhumanity, for instance, that when I'm doing this, I'm, I'm hiring, hiring a, to a cube or hiring a person into a company, and then I'm doing my uh, commercialization and I'm doing all this other fun, this other fun, fancy stuff. 
I understand that thematically this is what I'm doing, but from a gameplay teaching perspective, it's a nightmare. It's a nightmare to teach that game. If you if you see my teach of Pax Transhumanity, you'll know that it's two hours long. And you'll know that a lot of that time is spent me just trying to translate these fancy words to what you're actually doing. And even then, at the end, yes, I'm using all the words and trying to use the words as, as correctly and, and properly as I can. But at the end of the day, uh, for a game like this and a game like Pax Transhumanity, it would serve it a lot better if we could have the rules explained as rules and then keep the lore to the side. Uh, this game, I understand that it, you know, sure, you might lose something if you take the theme away or if you take these fancy words away and just call it red square, uh, call it yellow square, call it green square, blue square. Uh, I understand that, but that that lowers the bar or that sorry, that raises the bar for entry point, because when I look at some of these cards uh, that you can get in the game. So, for instance, here's here's one. Here's one such card that you can buy in the game called Dancing Pig. So, you know, I kind of, I kind of, also, I want to comment on the artwork. I do like the artwork. The artwork is pretty nice. So here's some other cards showing the artwork. So I do appreciate the artwork, that whole cyberpunk thing going on. Uh, and that's pretty nice. But on this card, Dancing Pig, this one says, um, you get two of those yellow symbols, which, you know, that's what players would call it, two yellow symbols, or you can call it by its proper name, which the proper name here is, uh, you get two of the deception symbols. Those are called deception. Those are the commands. You get two deception, or you can execute the card, which is uh, execute to, what does it say? Execute to instead have one containment, is that contain? No, sorry, one contaminant uh, of your server on your server, swap, swap partitions with one spark on your server. So even in reading that, like I, I, I know we talked about some of those terms already, but when you first see that, especially as a new player, especially if I'm trying to introduce this to another person, they're like, okay, okay, Cool blue. What the heck is a partition, and what's a server, and does does this mean does this mean that I can swap, like if I'm here and I'm playing the the yellow player and I play this card, does it mean I can do this, like so? Because that's what it seems like it's telling me. It's like no no no. Actually, a server is your individual server. So if you're over here on the green server, and there's stuff like this, you're allowed to swap these two like that. Like you're allowed to do that. That's what that card says. Uh, which it could probably say in some simpler words, like from those, uh, if you're like on the, the tile that you're on, uh, you can swap two symbols of the thing. I, I guess we're using the terms is fine because it includes the symbols. But you get to the point to where it's like, it's like, it feels like you're always translating. You have to remember this terminology that only exists in this game. If there was a whole world of games, if there's a whole world of games that were in the series, like maybe if the designer made some more games, maybe they have and I just don't know about them then sure, you're kind of carrying your terms with you, much in the same way that in the PAX series, going back to that, uh, you had the whole concept of between at least PAX Emancipation and PAX Transhumanity, which I actually have over here. What's up? Let's keep talking about them. Um, between, the, between these two games in particular, whoop, sorry, between these two games in particular, you have terms that are shared. So you have the concept of viability is shared between these two games. You have the concept of commercialization is shared between these two games. Uh, and I think these are the only two games that I've played so far that have those terms. But those terms exist between two games. So if you learn one, you can kind of translate that over and play the other. And if you played one, you can translate, translate it over and play the other. So it kind of feels like a worthwhile investment because the system's being used more. But in this particular regards, in this specific game, I don't have any incentive to remember what a contaminant is. I don't have any incentive to know what a partition or a server is, what the difference is. I don't have, a, I don't have any incentive to learn what a network is. So we get to a point to where it's like, why am I learning these words when I'm just going to play this game, maybe play it once or twice and then put it back on the shelf. And then, you know, three months later, play it again once or twice and forget everything. So that's that's what I mean by the approachability factor is dropped immensely or dropped greatly because of the terms. Um, and then you also have some cards like this one, like Night and Chip, which is actually a pretty interesting card to play in the game. But if you read the words for this one, it says uh, when you execute or yeah, execute is uh, when you play the card. So execute means play the card and it says uh, instead of using the move so that particular symbol symbol which is called information according to this so instead of spinning that information symbol as a move uh, you can instead you can instead move from an open partition on either I'm sorry so you can move from your open partition to any other open partition with the move action so then you ask the question hey cool blue what is an open partition well according to the rules and I'll just scooch this down I was going to zoom out those Keep it consistent. Uh, an open partition is the edge of the board. Any spot that's not landlocked. 
So, you know, if we call the, if we just call it what it is, say the edge of the board, then it's much easier to kind of play the game. Uh, landlocked is another way you can kind of say that. So any spot that is the edge of the board, I can move from here, I can basically move to there. Or, sorry, I can move from here, I can move over to there, like so. That's, that's what I can do, that's what that allows me to do. I'm allowed to do that when I play knight and chip. But instead, we use these words of, you know, open partition, close partition, and once again, it's cool that it's trying to stay consistent with the theme, but it's getting in the way of the game at this point. Because now I gotta remember, okay, an open partition is any edge of the board, and a closed partition is an internal part of the board, where it's, it's landlocked. Okay, cool. Why couldn't you just say landlocked and edge of the board? That's, once again, that's another one of the, one of the words. Um, and then also you have the word of upload, and like, like I, I, can go, I can go on and on and on about examples. Um, it boils down to when you, if you want to invest the time in learning this game, you do have to also accept the fact that you will need to sit down and learn the words and learn the terminology and learn the jargon before you can actually fully play the game. Because uh, if you do take the time to sit down and learn the words and learn the definitions and learn the terms and kind of memorize what they mean, then the game plays out, like I said, in a more interesting way. Like there's some interesting situations that have happened. Um, I've had a playthrough once before to where uh, even though I was playing it wrong, I had a playthrough before where because of how the challenges were coming up uh, and because of the cards that were showing up and because of the abilities that I had, um, I actually faced a lot of a lot of interesting challenges. Like I actually spent five or six minutes sitting down there. I was like, okay, can I do this and this? And then I can play, I can play this card to move here, and then I can play this to do this thing, and I can play this to do that thing. And then, it, oh, 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 what if, what if I instead, hold on, what if I, what if I move this first, and then I play this thing, and then instead I did this thing to do that thing? Like, like that felt fun. That felt cool. Like I felt good. That was like a good puzzle experience, and like I loved that. That was that was great. That was that was worth the struggle for me specifically like i said because as somebody who has played games like pax trans humanity which are very opaque with their wording um, and i've been told so by many of people i've taught that particular game um, i understand that there's a barrier that just exists when it comes to playing games sometimes but this particular barrier is unnecessarily self-imposed as in we could have the theme and yeah if you're trying to avoid the accusation that the theme is just tagged on and you're trying to make it uh, as baked into the rules as possible that's fine uh sorry baked into the the game as possible that's fine but when you do that to the rules that's where the problem comes up and um just to because because i keep quoting the rules and i said we're going to come back to rule books so let's go ahead and jump over to the rule book uh so this is the rule book uh one of the things that starts off with the rule book so it kind of understands that it's a complicated game and uh, it goes here for the hacker's handbook which it says um game turns presented for the first time uh what does it say so, so the Hacker's Handbook is, uh, I mean, I'm having trouble reading that from my screen over here. It says, uh, game terms, game terms presented for the first time and defended, or defined, and defined in the small, bold, uh, section. Okay, cool. Small, bold caps, e.g. network. Okay, cool. Sure. So it's just kind of telling you ahead of time, it's like, hey, we got some terms going on. So we go into here, here's the components that you get in the game, which is, you know, pretty nice components. I do, I do enjoy the dice. The dice are really fun. As far as uh, the look of them and the feel of them, also they're engraved dice. Actually, I have one here. Take a look at it yourself. It's a nice engraved dice, and uh, it has a really cool, fun symbols, and, you know, it works out pretty well. I don't know if it's a fully balanced dice, but I don't know if it matters that much. Uh, and then over here, we have a blue section that has some card stuff, and let me, let me get to a... Uh, let me get to... Yeah, here's a glossary of terms. This is a section that some people have quoted before. So in the glossary of terms, if we uh, take a moment to just observe this particular section, this is giving us a translation of a lot of the different terms, a lot of different words. So it goes over the word server, what the servers are. It goes over the word home server, installation, which is little squares that you can put in, network, which is the entire board, partition, which is the actual individual sections. And it gives you an example of open partitions versus closed partitions. And that's fine, that's cool, and that's, that's great. But instead of instead of using these words, can we just do a copy replace? Uh, and by instead of saying closed partition, can we just say partitions not surrounded by others or border partitions? Uh, instead of saying uh, instead of saying uh, open partition, I'm oh, sorry, sorry. Closed partition is uh, anything surrounded by a whole bunch of stuff. Uh, cl open partition is the ones on the edge. Uh, and this one we say security level. Can we just say the the stage that you're on, the phase that you're on? Uh, and, and that will help this game out immensely because like this game is a game that in my opinion feels like pandemic but with more steps or sorry but with more words 
And I feel like those who enjoy games like Pandemic, to where you're trying to not be overrun by something, to where you're trying to manage a crisis that you're getting, and you're kind of getting random crises at random time, depending on how the car flips, I feel like those are good things in this game. Those are good qualities in this game. Like, this game does really well at giving you the ability to feel like uh, whenever you make a decision, it really matters. And it gives you that impactful decision. And that's something I feel like would be much appreciated by people who do like games like Pandemic. But unfortunately, um, if I take this game to somebody who does like Pandemic, like my sister-in-law, she loves the game Pandemic. Um, if I play this with her, she's going to be like, okay, what does this mean? What is that? What, is, what does that mean? It'll become too frustrating for her to play it and actually sit down and enjoy it because we d made a design decision to use these words of alpha hacker instead of first player. Uh, we use the words of command instead of, um, you know, the well, I guess command is fine. Sure. Command is the, the little special tokens that you get. Sorry, command is the uh, symbols, I mean, when you play the cards. Instead of using the words, uh, I guess, red circle, blue circle, green circle, uh, yellow circle, we use the word contaminant. And it's like, it's also, also some of the words are kind of counter to what you might think. So the word virus, for instance, virus is a good thing for you. Sparks are bad things. I feel like if we just simply swap those two words, just call it a spark for the good players and call it a virus for the enemy. So the enemy is doing a virus, but thematically speaking, it doesn't make sense because from... From a thematic perspective, we're hackers. We're trying to hack into an oppressive computer system that's like holding us down. So we're, we're the ones uploading viruses, which I understand from a theme perspective, but from a gameplay perspective, if you're trying to have somebody come into this game from a fresh start knowing nothing about this game at all, if you call the bad thing virus and you call the good thing spark, then I feel like you would have a lot more success, a lot more, uh, a lot more successful learning outcomes, if you will. Uh, and so sorry for all the shaky cam here. I'm just kind of adjusting the setup. Uh, and then you have a sequence of play and you got some other stuff going on and and also this, this is where you know some diagrams would be perfectly fine like if you just have a diagram even if it's just like a very simple basic saying the same words but pointing arrows that's much easier to approach as opposed to looking at a wall of text this is one of the problems that i had with the um neanderthal game when i was first trying to learn that and then here it gives a whole section dedicated to how sparks and guardians work sparks for uh for context are the black circles guardians are the black squares um flares are the gray circles and then firewalls yeah firewalls are the gray squares so you have those particular things being explained and then you, you, you got you got a whole bunch of stuff going on and like you have uh S smc so smc is the um it's a computer you're fighting it's the scenario that you're fighting basically and the scenario gives you different things like it gives you a different board state start it gives you a different uh a different thing that happens at the end of your turns and it also dictates how many rounds you're going to play so if you can just kind of take a moment, like I said, to kind of learn the words and learn what means what, this game is an enjoyable experience. Like you can have fun puzzling it together and figuring it out. But um, as one of the main critiques that I feel like I agree with 100% uh, said for this game, it feels like somebody who knows the game already wrote the rule book. And the answer is, yeah, that, I mean, of course, whenever you're making a rule book, that's true. But this was, this is, this was definitely written for somebody who was like so expert and, and uh, well-versed at the game that uh, they could use all the words like they knew they knew the difference between between uh, upload and install like if I say those two words to you those don't mean nothing because we haven't really talked about it unless you already know the game but upload is when you play three of a symbol from your cards and then you add in one of the matching circles so if I do upload of or of green then what I'm doing is I'm playing three green symbols on my cards and I'm adding one of these to the board like so and if I do an install install is basically I had to have three matching, I had to have three matching of a um, of a circle, so three matching green circles, and if I play another green symbol as a card, then I can. And there's no uh, there's no blacks, so there's no um, black or uh, white here. Then I'm allowed to convert those three circles into one green square, and the green square is more powerful than the green circles. And also understanding you know, what each one does and the difference between the circle, the green circles and the blue circles and the green squares and the, and the red squares. That's a whole task in its own, but that's just kind of one of the natural, you know, occupational hazards with learning how to play a board game, to be honest. But just simply the words, like if you just simplify the wording on things, I feel like this game becomes more approachable. More people play it, more people want to play it, more people want to come back to it and play it. But at this point, I feel like you need to actually play the game four or five times before you finally know what the words mean. And then on the sixth time, this game just opens up, becomes this great experience. On the seventh playthrough, you're just like, oh my gosh, this is even better. And it's like, I, I see, I see all the strides and you start finding out stuff. Whereas when you take a game like uh, Lost Ruins or Arnak, which I think I've, I don't know if I mentioned this video, but Lost Ruins or Arnak is another game where 
um, the symbolism is very much tuned as best as it can be to an entry level game. Uh, it is, all of of Arnak, I would argue, is not an entry level game. Uh, and this video is not specifically about that game. But using it as, a, as an analogy, um, Lost Runes of Arnak does a lot of heavy lifting on its own side to try to make the things as simple and as easy to understand as possible. Um, I don't think it actually achieves that on Lost Runes of Arnak, so don't, don't go away thinking I'm saying that game does a great job with explaining things. But it does a much better job than this game does because this game doesn't really try to simplify the terms. It gives you a reference sheet, which reference sheets are cool and all, but when I don't know the game yet, the most frustrating thing for me to do is to look at what the card says, try to look up in this table that's not alphabetically organized, and try to figure out what the heck is talking about or match a symbol to this. And if I can't match it, then I don't know if I can find it. And then if I can't find it, I ask the person sitting next to me. The person sitting next to me says, I don't know what that means either. And all of a sudden you got three or four people at a table who are frustrated because they don't know what the game means. When in reality, something as simple as an information token, all that means is you get to move. It's, it's, it's so, it's so, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's definitely one of the one of the weakest points of this game. Um, also, it's out of print, which is unfortunate because I, I think more people would enjoy it if they've played two or three games of it. But on the same token, this game takes about an hour and a half to play. Um, at worst, an hour and a half, an hour or so to play, if I recall correctly. So do you want to play three hours of a board game before you actually learn it? That's the big question. Um, I don't particularly think people who play board games a lot or people who might just be interested in this game, I don't necessarily think that they'll buy this game to be upset that they have to play it for three hours or understand it. But I feel like it will be a lot easier if after the first playthrough, you understand what's going on. And the second, third playthrough, you're actually having fun enjoying the game. Whereas in this game, the first playthrough, you're kind of getting your feet wet. Second playthrough, you're finally trying to translate the terms. Third playthrough, you're like, okay, cool. Oh, this is this. And you're trying to, you're trying to fully commit that to memory. And then the fourth playthrough finally opens up and you're actually trying to have fun. You know, fifth, sixth, depending on your learning styles. So yeah, um, there, there's, there's a lot of negative things in this game that all spawn from the terminology used. Um, mechanically speaking, this game is not that complicated. Uh, Gameplay-wise, this game is really not that complicated. Round-wise, this game is not that complicated. As far as what the enemy does or what the uh, SMC does to you, it's not that complicated. It's just very simple, straightforward, add more things. And then your goal is to stop, or sorry, remove those things and then make sure you manage it properly. And then try to make your, make your deck more efficient so you can do more stuff, sure. But that's not a hard concept, it's not a difficult concept. And uh, we, we haven't even had a time to talk about the fact that it is a deck builder. Um, that aspect I think does shine through very well. Um, I don't think it's much of a deck builder because you only have 15 cards total, so you can't just like build your massive deck, but you always have exactly 15 cards. So at least at the very least, the purchasing mechanic is fun. Uh, the mechanic of making your deck, well, your deck is already at a set level of efficiency, if you will. Um, but also just making your deck more powerful and kind of having it be stable. That's a fun concept. It uh, kind of emphasizes the usefulness of having exactly 15 cards because you have three rounds. You know you got three rounds and you draw your first five cards. You don't see the thing that you want. You know that thing that you want in the next 10 cards. And then you go and purchase or go and buy one of the new cards. And this forces you to add a card to your hand instead of your deck or discard. And then you cull one of the cards that you purchase with it. So you remove one of those cards that you purchase with. That's a great concept. I love that concept. Like, I, re I really wish more games would have it. Um, I don't know if I mentioned it here, but I might mention it somewhere else. But Lost Ruins or Arnak has a very has a somewhat similar system to where if you buy a relic or you buy one of the, the special blue cards, then you get to play the effect immediately. And then when you buy a, um, a item in Lost Ruins or Arnak, you get to add it to the bottom of your deck instead of adding it to your discard. Like, that's a really cool system. Like, like more things that let you use the things faster is always fun. Uh, in comparison, Marvel Legendary, which is a game I have a ton of, uh, that game, it's a standard deck building rules. You buy the thing, it goes to your discard, you don't get into your next shuffle. Yeah, it kind of runs that whole situation. So, at any rate, enough of me criti uh, critiquing the game. Um, I, I do want to clarify as much as I can that I do enjoy this game. Um, I do think this game is a worthwhile journey, especially if you love solo experiences and you like to have a lot of different decisions and puzzle it out. Um, there's a lot of fun puzzling that can be done here. Um, I did have a situation, if I recall correctly, back in the past, to where I was doing, uh, I was playing the game wrong. So, so let me just clarify, I was playing the game wrong back then. But uh, things came more down to dice rolls than I anticipated, because I feel like with a card or with a game where you're playing cards and you're trying to build your deck and you're trying to do things great uh, with your deck efficiency, there was a few different times to where things came down to just a dice roll. And I don't know if I was a fan of that. Um, we'll see how it goes in the future, especially as playthrough is about to come up. 
I feel like we might have at least one situation like that. But honestly, it's a game that has dice. It's it's inevitable. <laughs> it's inevitable that it happens. I don't know how much you can mitigate dice in this game, or if there's more mitigation of dice. But at any rate, that is this particular game, which is Renegade. Like I said, it's a game that uh, if you can find it for under, I would say under forty dollars, definitely worth buying. But it is currently out of print, so you're probably not going to find it there. And uh, it's a game that I have a few qualms with because of the whole terminology, like I've said a uh, hundred or 700 times already but even then i still think it's a worthwhile experience if you're willing to sit down and play it uh definitely a game to recommend definitely going to try out if you can uh so i'll go ahead and end it there so definitely let me know if you all you all have played this game let me know if you all have a similar feeling or maybe you have different opinions different perspectives i would love to hear what you have to say in the comments um, but outside of that hope you all enjoyed it and as always i will see you all whenever